Well, um, good afternoon, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, there's quite a few people in the David Baddiel tent, but you are the civilised people who wanted to learn about fiction. Um, so we're going to be talking today um, about writing fiction in 2021. Is it any different from any other time we've written fiction, or are there lots of things at play that make it harder to be a novelist now? And we have an extraordinary panel here uh, for you. I'm Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a non-fiction writer and soon to be a playwright, so I might chip in once or twice. Um, and then I have an amazing, amazing array of... I was going to say beauty, but Lionel, you're looking furious when, when I was about to say beauty. Um, and I'm going to start with when you. When have I end. ever taken your head off for calling me beautiful? That's why I put you over there, <laughs> just in case it happens today. So Lionel Schreiber is an extraordinary writer. She's a journalist. She has a column in The Spectator. She has 15 novels and short story collections. Um, many of the novels you will have read include Mandible of Family, Big Brother, The Post-Birthday World. And, of course, we need to talk about Kevin, uh, which was, I think, the biggest ever seller of the Women's Prize for Fiction. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Audience, that, you, you should have reacted a bit more than that. Thank you. Oh, it's the, po the post-lunch crowd, you see. That's what happens there. Um, and Lionel's latest is The Motion of the Body Through Space. Um, no, it isn't. Isn't it? What's that on the table? Uh, should we stay or should we go? Well, maybe I should be off. I've got that wrong already. Should we stay or should we go, ladies or gentlemen? Which Lionel will be signing later, as well as all the other books. Um, in the middle, we have the wonderful Sebastian Folks, who has 15 uh, novels and some amazing non-fiction as well. Uh, you will know some of the most beautiful historical fiction, Girl at the Leon d'Or, Birdsong and Charlotte Grey, but also contemporary books such as A Week in December, um, and wonderful extra things like the Bond continuation and... One of my favourites, the P.G. Woodhouse continuation, which I loved very much. Um, and Snow Country is uh, Sebastian's latest book, and I know that that is true. Um, and Sebastian is not signing, but there are many signed copies already in the bookshop, uh, so you can go and pick them up. And then finally, um, sitting next to me is Chibundo Anudso, who grew up in Lagos and moved to London in 2005, and had, and this is quite astonishing, uh, her first book deal at 19. Which is, and I think we need, thank you. <laughs> there we go. And it's written three novels so far, uh, and one of them, you remember, Welcome to Lagos, and the wonderful Sankofa, which is out now and is a Reese Witherspoon and a Between the Covers pick, uh, but also released a single, which we might talk about. Um, somebody obviously knows that, that's fantastic, uh, called Good Soil. And also you work in film as well. You've done some film I'm writing. Creepy, so, yes. You know, so I think everybody writes in different areas, but you're here today to talk about this thorny question. So is it a thorny question? writing, how do you write fiction in 2001? Is it, uh, 2001, <laughs> this is disastrous. All I can say is, I did not sleep very well last night. I feel that we should still be in 2001. 2021, is it any different? And are there different pressures at play? Lionel, do you want to start us off? Do you feel things have changed since you first started publishing? Yes, next. <laughs> and so how have they changed, my friend? <laughs> Um, I mean, some things haven't changed. Uh, how to tell a good story, uh, what makes a good story, uh, how hard it is to tell a news story. I mean, that's, you know, that's, these are constants. But clearly there are political pressures on fiction writers that uh, are very new and I believe are to be fiercely resisted. Uh, I've talked at length before about my dislike of this ostensible taboo of cultural appropriation, which taken to its limit means that all you end up writing is memoir because that's all you have a right to. It's basically anti-imagination. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the social media sphere is constantly generating artificial rules that uh, fiction writers are supposed to be, obey not only in their current and future work, but uh, are to be abraded for for not obeying even before the rules were invented. <laughs> um, and I believe these rules are to be resisted also. Um, Kate Clanchy recently got into trouble for having written uh, in a book of, uh, that came out in 2019 uh, uh, a phrase or two 
which used food words to describe uh, her, the, the characters in her book's complexion. And apparently, this is, a, this is something you're not supposed to do anymore. Um, why? And who made up that rule? And why do we have to obey it? And that's the level on which this stuff has to be challenged. Um, who, who thinks they can tell me how to do my job? And one of the reasons I, I signed up for this job is it doesn't have any rules, <laughs> right? Which suits me. I'm very anti-authoritarian. You don't want to go through airport security with me. <laughs> <laughs> And I like writing books because they are completely under my control and, and nobody's telling me what to do. In fact, that's, that's the fun part of writing books. It's also the hard part of writing books, that there, that there are no rules and therefore, you know, you have, to, you have to make up your own. For every book, you have your own set of rules. So um, I'm here to tell you that being a fiction writer now is a little more complicated than it used to be. It takes even more nerve than it used to, uh, and it takes a certain amount of political new. Um, it, you can't be as naive as it used to be possible to be, and uh, you have to stake out your claim to the right to make up whatever you want, and you didn't used to have to do that. You didn't have to use to defend your right to invent whatever characters you want, to use the language that you think is appropriate to your project, and now you do. Um, and I think that as a collective, fiction writers have been rather timid in defending their own rights. Uh, so um, I'm hoping that our panel is an exception to that rule. <laughs> well, that, that is a great beginning digest of some of the things that are at stake. Sebastian, do you feel that there, I mean, obviously respond to some of what Lionel said or all of what Lionel said, but do you think there's any difference um, between writing things that are set in a historical period, so they are possibly protected by the views of the time, to writing contemporary fiction? Because you do both. So I wonder if you feel you have a different uh, kind of pressure, depending on what type of fiction you're doing. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't. I mean, I think this uh, these imaginary rules invented by anonymous warriors hiding behind the shield of their anonymity in social media, which I don't really follow. Um, I think they apply equally to fiction set in the twenty first or the twentieth or the nineteenth century. I mean, obviously, there has been a slight change. Uh, I feel a slight change myself insofar as my last. Uh, book Paris Echo, uh, I was aware of this happening, and at the launch party, uh, basically summarizing what Lionel has just said, I said, writing fiction is a cultural appropriation. That's exactly what it is. You're imagining and taking over the lives and backgrounds and religions and histories and thoughts and feelings of people who are not you. It's almost a definition of fiction. Um, but um, my daughter, who is a literary agent, said... <laughs> dad. Um, dad, dad. Um, it, is, it is vexed. And of course, you, you know, people do impose on themselves certain self censorship. For instance, I've never written about a gay character. Not because I feel beaten up by anonymous warriors on TikTok or wherever the hell it's called, but because I just don't feel like could really. I'm just not sure I can. So we all sort of censor ourselves a little bit. Um, and I, I think it's important for people of my age, the derided baby boomer age, not to uh, sneer completely at what uh, a younger generation is trying to do. Um, you know, we had our go, and our go in the 1960s was all people are equal. Um, that's what we hippies and uh, we progressives believed. And to talk about someone's background, nationality, religion, race, sexual feelings, let alone the colour of their skin, was an utter embarrassment. I mean, you just wouldn't. I mean, we're all equal. Uh, and the younger generation has not just evolved. It has, it's a revolution to say that these things are not negligible and wrong to mention in, mention in polite society. They are, in fact, all defining and all important. 
So I think people of my generation need to get their heads around that. It's not an evolution. It's a complete revolution which we are being asked to um, understand. Uh, so my view is that rather than be an old fart about it, um, one should try to understand. And my great get out is that it's not for people of my age and my background to fight this battle. It is for a younger generation. It's their war, and I wish them very well with it, and I hope it is fought intelligently and with good grace and uh, with kindness. Um, but uh, I can spectate, but in my work, I'm, uh, I still feel... I mean, I, I don't want to keep on saying I agree with Lionel, but she's put it very well. You know, the, our job is to make things up, uh, and we don't want to be reduced into a corner where we're simply writing memoirs about 68-year-old 60 white guys who were born in Berkshire. <coughs> There's no one's going to fight. <laughs> Do you know one such a person? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm writing that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, you are not here to represent the younger generation. However, you are very much younger than the rest of us. Um, but uh, you have written three novels now, published three mm -hmm, novels. Mm -hmm. um, so do, do you recognise what Sebastian said, that there's possibly a generational difference in how writers of fiction are thinking? Because Lionel, Sebastian and I are all in our 60s, and you are not. No, I'm not. That's <laughs> correct. Well, in fact, we could be, I could be your mother. <laughs> I'm just thinking of that. I wish actually, that I had the time and space to concern myself with such lofty things as <laughs> cultural appropriation. Actually, most of what I'm thinking about is how to make money. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's my own main concern as a fiction writer in 2021. Um, but I mean, I do, I do have thoughts on, on this debate. I think, first of all, the idea that writers have never had to defend their work. Um, my question is, you know, which writers? So for example, I'm, an, I'm a Nigerian writer, I'm an African writer. Um, so the first generation of African novelists had to defend their rights to write in English, for example. Some people felt this is a European form, you know, the likes of Chinua Achebe, et cetera. They had countless conferences, what languages are we allowed to write in? I think the idea that writers have never had to defend their work, have never had to defend their rights to write what it is that they write. I don't think um, that holds true. I think it depends on where in the world you're writing from, which power centers, who has the power, who has the economic power. In the Soviet Union, in you know, most of the 20th mm -hmm. century, there was a great deal of restriction on writing. Yes, exactly. So there's that. Um, but I also think that also an audience has expanded so I don't think that people shouldn't write outside their race or write outside their experience. But I also think that you should be ready or be prepared for a challenge from the people who belong to that experience who, or who live that experience. And I don't think that is censorship. I think that is just debate and discussion. And I say it all the time. When you know, Joseph Conrad wrote you know, Heart of Darkness, his audience. He did not imagine that someone like Chino Achebe would be in his audience and say, no, that depiction of Africa is utter nonsense because I'm an African. Um, and it's not censorship for Achebe to say that. It's a challenge. Um, and it's not saying that Conrad shouldn't have written Heart of Darkness. But if you are going to write outside of your experience, be prepared for that challenge. And I think, I know this as a, as a Nigerian, even just writing about Ghana, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> Sankofa is, is based on... Um, it's based on Ghana loosely. And so I know that you know, some Ghanaians might be like, actually, no, how dare you take our culture? And you, you have to be prepared for that challenge. Um, and I think that's just sort of, as, the, as a reading audience broadens, that's just natural. Because, I mean, the, the, the thing about this idea of only writing from your experience, obviously, then fiction does stop. It all becomes autobiography. And one would hope that there would be no crime fiction at all. Otherwise, we're all surrounded by murderers all of the time. Um, so is that actually part of the issue? That it's, in a funny sort of way, not us as novelists. It's not our responsibility, but it's about publishers to publish a wider range of people so that each of us on this stage can write what we want to do, but without that sense that somebody else's voice is being silenced because mm. of it. I mean, d is there an element of truth in that? That we're being asked to kind of stand up for what publishing has not done in the past, in terms of representation? Oh. What do you think? I mean, no, I don't think it's individual writers' responsibility to balance the list. And exactly. No, it's not our no. 
problem. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, just to backtrack on the previous point, uh, there is a difference, and this is a common confusing, there's a, a difference between um, finding the execution of a book wanting in some way, especially if you're writing in the re realistic tradition and there are factual inaccuracies to do with a particular community. Uh, that's just poor homework, poor craft. And the absolute right, you know, to, to, to create a character or to, to use material that is not, strictly speaking, your birthright. And th that, they are very different. There is nothing. Uh, uh, certainly, there's room for debate. There's room for criticism. Um, so you know, you, you, your Ghanaian characters may not believe that they are represented in a realistic way, and you have to be willing to take that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just ordinary literary criticism. Nothing wrong with it. So where I draw the line is saying, and therefore you have no right to write about Ghanaians. So you have a right to write about everyone, right? In the same way that w we have a right to criticize the way you've executed it, and that's fine too. Yeah, I, I think that's a logical line which appeals to me and people of our generation. And you take the case of D.H. Lawrence, for instance, who has been pretty much cancelled um, for daring to write about women and women's feelings and women's sexual feelings and describing a female orgasm even. And even as you describe that, you think... That's quite risky, but you're, what you're doing is just upping the ante, isn't he? I mean, he, you better get right, get this right, David Herbert. You better be right that this is what it feels like, because if not, you're going to come an almighty cropper. But I would um, defend his right to try and do that. Um, um, but there were people who would not defend his right to do that, and that's why he's been uh, cancelled. I, I don't think it's right to think that we are taking the place um, of other writers from underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, in fact, to go back to your original question, Kate, I think publishers are working incredibly hard to get, I mean, to, to get people from underrepresented backgrounds into print all the time. I mean, my daughter, the agent, she's not going to thank me for talking about her anymore, but I mean, all her clients are people from such backgrounds, all of them. Um, but uh, I was also, it was very uh, funny what um, Tabundu was saying about Ghana, Ghana and Nigeria, because I have the same problem in France. I mean, my last book was set in Paris, um, and the French publisher said, um, a book about Paris by an Englishman? I don't think so. <laughs> 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 Absolutely not. Um, and the, char but the characters in it, um, one was an American woman in her 30s, which I'm not, and one was a, an Arab Muslim boy from North Africa, age 19, which I'm not. But to me, that was just, okay, here's the challenge. Let's go. These are the characters. They're not me. They're someone else. And, you know, this is what I'm going to enjoy doing. This is what I'm paid to do. Um, but the most, the harshest criticism I had was from uh, our following, not actually a book, but um, following a, a newspaper interview I did to publicize a week in December, uh, which had a character in it who was... Um, misled by Muslim fanatics into a very dangerous position. And in talking to the journalist, I somewhat over-explained um, things. And a very nice man called Anjum Chowdhury, who ran a um, website called Islam for UK, suggested that, that I might be not just cancelled, but terminated. <laughs> um, anyway, he's just come out of prison, so... Um, <laughs> He's around to offer his literary criticisms again. <laughs> so that's fun, isn't it? I, I had a really completely different thing in, in France. Um, that m My first big novel was a novel called Labyrinth, which was about the Cathar Crusade, and it's very much all of my historical fiction are love letters to Carcassonne in that part of France. Um, and I did start to think, you know, I wonder what my friends and actually people I don't know in Carcassonne feel about an English woman essentially being the person that puts that history out there in a, in a fictional sense, in a significant sense. So one signing, I did actually say, and I was a little bit worried that people might feel it was a bit of a cheek, me doing this, you know, rather than somebody from the area. And she looked at me and said, my dear, better an Englishwoman than a Parisian. <laughs> so, so, it, you know, so there are shades and shades. Chibundu, is, is this chiming with you, some of these thoughts about, or do you feel actually free to write what you want? First of all, I don't think that publishing is 
working hard enough, actually, to, um, to, to solve the fact that you know, it hires from a very specific demographic. Um, and I also don't think that, I come from a different cultural tradition. So I can't say that I don't have any personal responsibility, or I can't say that I don't feel any personal responsibility. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. When I walk into a publish, publishing party and I'm the only black person, I notice same way when you started the Women's Prize. It was the same thing. You walked into things like, why am I the only woman here? And you started something to change it. Um, and I think publishing does have a problem. I've been published since I was 21, and I have never worked with a black person until Sankofa. Um, and this is from agency, agents to editors to publicists to rights directors to to all across the, you know, the entire, there's something wrong with the, there's something wrong with the hiring chain where people only hire in their image. Um, and I worked with lovely people and they're kind and they're nice people, but they are replicating a system that the only hire people that look like them are from the same background. If I may, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that the staff at publishing companies, especially on that lower level, you know, all the assistants the, um, that, you'll, that you and I both deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons they're mostly f from white, middle class, or affluent backgrounds is that the jobs don't pay enough, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of these people are going to be subsidized by their parents, um, especially if they're living in London, as they often are. Uh, they'll be given help from their parents to buy a house or an apartment. Um, it's, part of the explanation is economic. It's not just a prejudice about wanting, I mean, I, I know that there's, a, there's an aggressive desire in a lot of publishing companies to hire more diverse staff, and it's difficult. I mean, uh, my uh, a former publisher at Farrar Strauss in New York told me that they have, hired countless um, uh, minority employees, and they can't keep them. If, if they're talented, they're well-educated, they can write their own ticket, and why should they work for this terrible salary? And, and that is one element in what is making it very difficult for, for publishing uh, on the staff level to diversify even as much as, as a lot of these companies want to. Just to, um, I'm, you know, do, I don't know if you want to respond to that or, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about what we're here to talk about in terms of fiction mm -hmm. writing. Is, if, as I think, the purpose of fiction is partly reflection, but very significantly more empathy the ability to stand in somebody else's shoes, not simply to hold a mirror up to nature or however we think about it. This is the question about, do you need to um, have experienced everything to write about it? Or is this ex exactly the fundamental thing about writing fiction at any time, 2021 or you know, 1821, the idea that you imagine yourself into the shoes of somebody you are not as much as into the shoes of somebody you are? Because that's the heart of writing fiction, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I don't think the heart of... I don't read books because I think, right, I need a lesson in empathy. I read books to be entertained, actually. Mm. Um, and I think that's sort of... Sometimes maybe why that's why a reading public is declining, because fiction is treated as some sort of cultural medicine that, yeah, you, right. that you take to get some empathy. And it can be a byproduct of that. But I think um, just as a reader, first and foremost, I want to to be entertained. Mm. So how do you choose what you read? Hmm, that's a good question. How do I choose what I read? Well, I'm in a book club. Um, <laughs> and so people select books and we read books every month. Um, I read reviews, um, prize lists, yeah. So you kind of, you do, you take recommendations, essentially. Yes, 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 yeah. I do. And what about you guys? How do, how do you choose what to read in this context of who's writing what and who feels they are able to write what? 
I choose what I read, but my wife tells me what to read because uh, <laughs> she works at a bookshop. Um, uh, or my daughter. So I it is back to economics, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. but, um, obviously, I read, I read reviews too. But largely, I read books which are helping with the background of the book that I am writing. Um, so that's, that's what, what I do, really. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, I, I think you're right, Kate, that you know, this is the prime... Um, the prime job of the fiction writer is to imagine things that he or she hasn't experienced and to try to make them into some kind of universally accessible work of art which can be approached and understood by people who have themselves also not had that experience. That to me. But of course that is a very old fashioned view. Uh, even as I say it, I hear myself sounding quite sort of 19th century. Um, uh, but it's, it's really how you do it, I think. I mean, I because I am really genuinely interested in this, in this debate, um, I, I wrote a television adaptation of the Na uh, Nagib Mahfouz, the Cairo trilogy, um, which was great fun to write. Um, Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize, but the, his, his book, the Cairo trilogy, is a family story of a family in, in Cairo in the 1920s. It's very like the Foresight saga, but with a bit more sex and booze. I mean, it's great fun. It would make marvelous television. Um, but the thing is that there are, the family, there are two girls, and one's pretty and one's plain, and that's the whole, that's the big deal about them. Of course, there's more to their characters than this. It's a better book than just that. But visually and televisually and dramatically, this is the big thing. And a friend of mine who works in TV said, um, I'm glad you've enjoyed writing this, but have you actually mentioned in the stage directions that one of these girls is better looking than the other one? And I said, well, kind of my food makes quite a big play of it. He said, just go through and take it all out. So I went through the stage directions, I took it all out. And you know what? It didn't make any difference at all. Because it was all there in the story. It was all there in what the girls said. The pretty one spent so much time looking in the mirror, and our younger brother would say, oh, for goodness sake, get over yourself, love. And the plain one was always saying to the mum, I'll never find a husband with a nose like mine. So you, you could actually take out this objective description completely and let the characters work for themselves. Do you think it's about sensitivity, then? A lot of these criticisms, you know, that being sensitive to not upset one particular group of people or another group of people. So, the sisters, <laughs> the oh. sisters that feel less pretty than their. No, it was quite cynical. I mean, I just thought it, it's got a better chance of being made if I take it right. out. Um, <laughs> but I, I think once once you go down the line of, of of thinking about the sensitivity of every single person who reads it, you're lost. You you have to be robust about what you've created, and you have to believe in it. And yep. I, was, I, was, I was interested, I mean, you know, Lionel, when you, when you started, you were talking about, you know, your job is to do your job. Mm -hmm. So that your primary responsibility, in a way, is to your own imagination more than anything else. Is that how you f think of it when you're writing a piece of fiction? When an idea comes to you, do you just think this is an idea that is going to shine or this might not go anywhere, you, you don't have any external thoughts about whether this is going to be a novel that might entertain or sell or... Um, I'm obviously going to try to write a book that's going to sell. <laughs> um, when I get it, an idea I'm excited about, I think other people will find it appealing also. I am sometimes wrong. <laughs> um, but I have to abide by my instincts. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we can't be as naive as we used to be, and I'm not. So, you know, I'm entertaining an idea right now that I have a feeling is going to skirt trouble. Um, can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that little frisson of danger actually attracts me to the idea. It doesn't discourage me from writing it. It, it makes it a little more exciting. Um, and likewise, there was a subplot in uh, The Motion of Body Through Space, which is the two books ago. <laughs> and I knew perfectly well that, uh, that this subplot was going to infuriate a, a subsection of of the readership, but they were mostly people that were, weren't going to fancy my fiction anyway. Um, so I, I decided not to worry about it, because that's also the section that 
a, another subset of the population especially liked. Um, bottom line is, you know, there's a, you can't, you can't set out to please. You can certainly set out to entertain. And I think that's a very good point, because I try never to lose sight of that. That is the purpose of fiction. It isn't supposed to be medicinal. It's supposed to be fun. It's a luxury. It's what people do with their free time. Um, and it shouldn't be something that you suffer through. So that should be above all. And that's above political purpose or any of that stuff. Um, but you know, in the current uh, highly polarized, highly sensitive political environment, that means there's a lot of crackling energy around, and I can't leave it alone. It's too interesting, and it's too potentially electric for the project. Yes. Well, so there's this concept. Again, I come from a, a different cultural tradition. There's this concept of Ubuntu. You know, I am because you are. And I don't think that when you, when you, I don't think that you should be obsessed, preoccupied by your reader. You're right. There is that element of this is a personal work. This is a work of imagination. But I'll use Sankofa as an example. Um, again, as I said, it's loosely, there's a fictional country. It's loosely based on Ghana. Um, and I gave it to Ghanaian readers to read before it was published, not because I thought, right, well, if they say I can't do this or I can't do that, well, I'm going to take it out. Um, and not even for fear of upsetting them, but more, and I think it makes the work stronger because I think humility is also a part of writing. And when you are writing out of your experience, you have to approach the subject matter with that humility and say, I want to hear what somebody who grew up in this, who speaks the language, who speaks the, the food, I want to hear what they think about my work honestly, and I have to be humble enough to take that feedback because I'm not Ghanaian, so they have an access to an experience. I can't just say that my imagination obliterates Ghanaian real experience. Um, and, I don't think, and I think it serves the work. I think it makes, it makes the work better for approaching it with this sense of, you know, it's, it's not a battle, it is a discussion, it is a let me, let me see this thing from another perspective. I think it strengthens the work. I had an, um, in, you brought up France. Um, I had an interesting experience uh, just earlier uh, in October. Uh, I was on the road for my last book that just came out in France. And I, um, I had dinner with a couple of gay guys. Uh, they were, both French, from, and they lived in a little village in Brittany. And they had done very well with the first novel they wrote together called uh, Alabama 1963. Um, and this is where I, I really tested myself on the cultural appropriation issue. I was born in the American South. These two men had never been to Alabama. Um, and had written about American race relations in the American South at an age that I would have been a kid. And I had a little reaction. <laughs> a little like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, you know, that doesn't belong to you, right? And I had to catch myself on because it was, okay, all right, I don't own that. And who knows? It hasn't been translated into English, so I can't testify. Who knows? Maybe they told a really great story, and, and in so doing, whether or not they've ever been there, they, they owned it by, by bringing it to life. So. I was called upon to share my heritage <laughs> with a couple of gay guys in Britain. Okay, okay. okay. But, you know, but it's like D.H. Lawrence and the female orgasm. It better be good. Yeah. That, that, it's, a, it's a high tariff dive. It's Tom Daly off the top board with a triple inverted somersault and double pike twist. Fine, but it's got to be good. 
But if you do get it right, you get very high marks. Yes. But I, I want to disagree with um, you okay. two. Sorry, okay. if I may. Very no, briefly. Go, go. We're allowed to disagree. With I mean, I don't really see the reader as... Uh, I think about the reader a lot. And I don't see the reader as someone who's potentially going to take offence or cancel me or kill me. Uh, I think of them as someone I'm trying to enlist in my job. Uh, so I'm giving them a character in Snow Country, Lena, the main character, a female character, or Anton, the main male character. And I'm describing them in such a way that I'm leaving room for the reader to come in and help me. And I'm pushing them down one way, and then I'm pulling back and then thinking, is he really like that? Oh, I wasn't expecting that from her. And I'm trying to get them in. And basically, I'm trying to talk to the reader around the back of the character. And that is, to me, the most interesting thing that you can do as a novelist, the relationship you have with your reader. And I think of them as collaborators, uh, not as critics, uh, in, in jointly understanding the character and building the character together. And that sounds a little bit fey, I know, but because obviously I am the master, I am the puppet, you know, I'm pulling the strings. And at the end, they, the characters will do what I want them to do. But with any luck, the, the um, relationship between me, the character, and the reader is triangular. And that's what gives the reader a sense of real gratification uh, at the completion of the character's story, I hope and believe. And furthermore, I do think that there is a didactic purpose to fiction. I think it's fine to say it's just a story, we just had to make money, but I'm not. Um, I, my books have a very strong didactic purpose. Um, I learned everything I know about life from reading Dickens and Proust and Jane Austen. Um, I would be completely deficient in any understanding of any other human being were it not for what I've learned from reading fiction. And I think it is uh, a perfectly reasonable aim to try to share an understanding of history and people and psychology and human beings through um, a work of fiction. And um, so that's what I do try to do a little bit. But yes, but that's easy to say, Sebastian. You have made well, money. Well, it wasn't now. that easy to say. You, you, <laughs> have, you have made money. You have made money from, from fiction, nevertheless. But let, let me go back to, to Lionel and Alabama 1963. Let's, let's go back to that, to that novel. Now, let's say that in the world now, the recognized and the most popular depiction of Alabama was from a novel written by two men who had never been to Alabama. How would you feel about it then? <laughs> because that's what happens in the other context. That's what happens through my own I, You know, what mm -hmm. I was doing is acknowledging that little begrudging and mm -hmm. that little possessiveness about material that has to do with your life that naturally seems to more belong to you mm -hmm. and, and, um, and then calling myself to my own ostensible convictions. But I'm saying let's take so, it to yes, step I could see mm -hmm. I could see finding an irony in that, mm -hmm. but if that book turned out to be a magnificent work of art that how, however weirdly from some natural intuition or great artistic insight ended up being a fantastic representation of Alabama in 1963, then more power to them. But that's my point. What if it wasn't? What if you read it and thought, that's a rubbish interpretation of Alabama, but it is the most famous and most popular and most recognized depiction of Alabama. That's what happens in an African context. Or black, that is why the debate about cultural appropriation is so charged. So let's talk about African fiction. So one, I, I enjoy the number one ladies detective agency. It's a fun book, mm -hmm. but it is not <laughs> the depiction of Botswana. That should be the most famous in the world. <laughs> Bessie Head should be better read than Alexander McCall Smith if you want to look for a representation of Botswana. But it's not. The books have been turned into films. Mm -hmm. The books have gone all over the world. And that is the recognized depiction of Botswana. And that's, that's, that's the thing that you can't divorce from cultural appropriation. It's not just saying that, oh, you can't write about this experience, it's not your experience. It's also about power. It's also about economic power. It's also about whose voice gets to be the loudest when they write outside of an experience that is not their own. Yes, and, and also... <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that is exactly the point about the, the plurality of books published. So that if you ever have this situation where a particular novel is taken to be the one representation, it, if you like, it becomes the history rather than the piece of fiction. That is very problematic because, you know, 
just from the point of view of, of women's stories, um, a lot of history is predicated on the fact that women never did this, they never did that. But it's not true. Hmm. It's just a lie. <laughs> Uh, you know, common sense says the women were there and they were doing this, they were doing the others. So that is the problem if you have just one representation of, any, of anything. But that, I guess, come back to the idea of not the responsibility of publishers, because I don't want to get back into that, but the idea about individual writers needing to be free, and that sits over there as, as important, versus the industry of which we're all part being broader so that there are many different fictional voices putting their fictional stories out there, that no one person becomes the sole spokesperson. Well, you can't stop bestsellers happening, can you? But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's much better that people read Wally Soyinka and Tinor Achebe to get their idea of, of West Africa. But, they, I mean, these guys are pretty famous and yeah. Nobel prized up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I mean... It, that's partly why I asked what you guys read as well, because mm. I think that this is what is interesting, this sort of sense of the way that certain novels do become hand-to-hand-to-hand-to-hand, -hand -to -hand -to -hand, and then everybody's read them. And other novels maybe don't, and we all know novels that we think should be better known or we wish had done, you know, all, all of those kind of things, isn't mm. it? So what we recommend as writers is also part of how we are as writers, I presume. Yeah, I don't... It's not an either-or. So I'm not saying... As I said, I've, I've read and enjoyed the number one ladies' detective agency. Read that, but also read Bessie Head if you're going to read up to. It's, it's that balance and it's that the other side is often not heard. And so that's why it feels so, um, that's why it feels so, that's why it's so emotionally charged. It's the same thing when The Help, when the help came out, um, the book by Catherine Stockett. And it was a massive book, read it, enjoyed it. But the main critique was, why is it this account of the experience of Southern black maids. That is the one that is so fated. That is the one that gets turned into a movie when there have been other accounts written by African-American women that haven't had that same treatment. It's, it's a question about power. Okay, but on the other side, okay. I was, I, um, Alexander McCall Smith is published by HarperCollins. That's my publisher. Mm -hmm. And I was told with a sense of depressed authority by uh, uh, one of the higher-ups in HarperCollins, that they're pretty sure that if uh, the number one ladies detective agency landed on their desks today, they wouldn't feel they could publish it. And I think that would be a loss. I can see how you would be uh, a little arced, you know, why is this the most famous story told about women in Botswana when there are, there are other better, better books? Then fine, I, I can see that frustration. But I don't like the fact that we have arrived at a point where um, publishers are now so anxious about this cultural appropriation issue that they would turn that book down which, whatever you may think of it, I mean, I can't even say because I haven't read it, but it's clearly entertained a lot of people, and uh, it would s seem to be a pity that, that that would be turned down today. And so maybe that is part of what the, we as a panel are coming towards, that there are different forces at play, maybe, in what's being chosen and what's being published, and we might all have different views about whether that's good or bad or somewhere in between, mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to go out to the audience in a moment, um, because I'm sure you've all got some questions. Um, but just before I do that, in terms of, as we're all talking around this, and everybody, you know, I, I, everybody has, I think, been really honest and open about the things that they're thinking. Back to the question of, do we as novelists feel in any way restricted? I just want to kind of land that before I start taking audience questions. Because it seems to me that in a way, you don't feel restricted in that you're, you are all writing the books you want to write. You might slightly change some description or you might slightly not have that particular story or you might decide not to put a character from you know, a different country in. But in a way, you all sound like you still feel that your job is, as a novelist is to make up a story. Is that true? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm being honest, guys. I'm going to end where I started. My biggest restriction is money. That is my, you know, this panel has been fun, but the, my biggest restriction, <laughs> this panel has been fun. My, biggest, my biggest restriction is money. Is the thing, how, how to make money from my writing. My dream is just to like, have a house, have a, a temple to writing. I think people call them home studies, you know. Have a room, temple. home offices, yes. Have a room where I sit down and type my novels and they sell enough money and that's all I do. But I found that, it's funny, you mentioned me writing for film. That's part of why I've sort of moved into writing for film. I heard they paid better. <laughs> Any film people here, I am a writer for hire. No, but you do, you, you have to, you, so you sort of have to become almost sort of like a creative entrepreneur. Like, where can I take my storytelling to? Because this, this fiction writing is my first love. Um, but yeah, making money from it is difficult. And that don't, is partly don't write for point. film. They pay less, and the films never get made. So you know, stick with the fiction. Come and use my spare room anytime. I promise you. <laughs> and uh, but I think there is uh, the Alexander McCall Smith is an absolutely vital issue, isn't it? I mean, the, this is this is the point. I'm not Harry sure. Harry Keating I, before I, him actually. I'm not sure I would novels. publish it now, but I wouldn't cancel him retrospectively. And I think there's a diff there is a difference. I mean, I would say, let's find out, let's find out about Botswana from another source, a better source. And, but I certainly wouldn't cancel him or, you know, and denigrate him or you know, put him off in any way. But, I mean, I think that is, that is a change that, you know, old people like me need to listen to, frankly. And uh, I don't see a problem with that. And uh, but to go to your question, Kate, about feeling uh, constrained, I just in Snow Country available at one good bookshop over the way. Uh, Signed copies, ladies and gentlemen. As an experiment, I did with the main female character in this, not describe her physically. Be people hardly describe characters physically anymore anyway. You don't have the sort of hawk-like nose and the cruel eyebrows and the thin lips. You know, no one does that kind of stuff. But I just made a point of not having her seen and described by a man at all during the book, although she has a lot of sex during the book. And I just did that as an experiment to see what it would feel like. So the only idea you get about what she looks like is when she's pulling at her hair and uh, despairing with her tangly hair, and once when a female work colleague of hers comments on the way she looks. I did this just to see what was lost and what was gained. Uh, it made almost no difference at all. I don't suppose any reader will notice, but I found it faintly invigorating and faintly liberating yeah. until such time as the Daily Mail picked up the story and told a lot of lies about it. But anyway, but I don't feel constrained to do that. I did it of my own free will because I am interested in this. And, and I in am the craft in of creating. Yeah, character. and I do listen and hope to learn. Yeah. Lionel, do you want to add anything? Um, I can't help but be aware that when I take on certain subjects or characters, uh, they're going to be scrutinized in a way that they wouldn't have been even 10 years ago. Um, it doesn't mean that I write in a spirit of fear and cowardice. In fact, I, I think one of the one of the keys to writing fiction is to indulge in the conceit that you are all by yourself in your study and you are your only reader. So I'm, I don't write consciously for, for an audience. I think that's paralyzing. Uh, but I can't help but, all, but know, and that's an intrusion of somebody kind of looking over my shoulder onto my screen, um, when I'm writing something that is against the rules I, I referred to at the beginning. Um, I go ahead and write it because I think I'm all by myself. Um, but sure enough, you know, in this current environment, um, if, write, if I write a character of a different race or ethnicity, that, uh, that dialogue is going to be looked at very closely um, it's now very dangerous to use any kind of transliteration of accent, um, which I, you know, I'm not a big advocate on an artistic level of, of heavy-handed transliteration of accent, but I, I think it's a, a loss for that to be completely removed from your quiver. And I've essentially been informed by HarperCollins that, you know, you basically, you can't do that anymore. And I think that's absurd. Come over to Random House. <laughs> <laughs>
There we are, you see. And, and they brought it back to publishers yet again. Right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a few questions. So could you fling your hand in the air? Thank you, gentlemen over there. And um, somebody with a microphone will assail you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, kind of two questions. Firstly, this um, Carmen Mola prize-winning team of three male writers writing about female fiction. Any thoughts on that? The team aspect of it um, is maybe more interesting rather than the individual creator. And then secondly, um, this idea of the literature as entertainment, but also a sort of cultural education. So, um, you can do one or the other. Very hard to do both successfully. And is that part of the issue? Thank you. Does anybody want to take that? I mean, I, I don't think it is hard to do both. I think that all novels that kind of have integrity in terms of them being themselves do a whole host of things. Most of us don't just sit down and think, right, today I'm going to write a novel that will be didactic or will tell people about... You know, I didn't sit down and think I must translate everything about 13th century Cathar belief. Uh, for my readers. I thought I'm going to tell a really cracking story about women's voices and then at the end of it people will know a lot about Cathar history but you know I, I think you can do both but I don't know if anybody would like to take either of those questions. I'd say uh, I don't think there is an obligation for fiction to be edifying, educational. It, it can just be entertaining. It can be both. It can be almost anything you want it to be. That's one of the interesting things about the form. It's incredibly elastic. I think where I resist uh, current expectations of fiction are that it be good, that it be in some ways virtuous or promoting a set of values that we can endorse. And I don't think that fiction is obliged to be virtuous. It can be mischievous. Um, as on, on the entertainment front, uh, I don't think that there's a, a problem with, you know, a conflict between wanting to be culturally informative or, you know, have added value in some other way. Partly because some of that cultural information is entertaining, you know? And for, ideas can be entertaining. Ideas can be fantastically entertaining, especially in conflict. And I use that all the time. Uh, I sometimes put uh, factual information in my books just because I find it fascinating. I've discovered this thing that is not widely known, and and it is entertaining because it is not widely known, and it's in some way surprising or profoundly informative about the world. And that's one of the great things about doing research for fiction. And you can add a little nonfiction that, that happens to be true that is supremely entertaining. So I don't find, I, I don't find myself uh, in conflict very often or perhaps ever uh, in, in the twin goals of Maybe, maybe throwing in some information uh, that you don't, I don't, all my readers are not going to have, and keeping you entertained. They, they're the same. Thank you. Another question. Gentleman there, then a gentleman there. Yeah. Yes, if you pass that and you pass that, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you for a fascinating panel. Um, I'm curious just exploring the, the, intention for historical accuracy. So at what point does fiction have to be historically accurate? Because often I feel, feel preached to that when I see groups on TV you know, lambasting an author because it didn't historically represent a group accurately or a situation accurately, to what extent do you feel compelled to? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody looks at but. Yeah. Well, uh, any, anything you put in and, and claim to be true has to be true. I mean, the great relief about being a, a novelist and not a historian is you don't have to know everything. But in order to be accurate in the facts or things that you claim are true and that your characters undergo, 
you need to have read widely, but you don't need to be omniscient. But you, of course you have to be accurate because to some extent fiction is a kind of illusion, it is a conjuring trick, and if you see the, see the hand move, it, it spoils it for people. And if someone knows, I mean, I, I have this problem watching The Crown or any historical drama on TV because there are so many anachronisms in the speech. You know, um, Dis yeah. Disraeli says, this one's going down to the wire. What? I mean, there's just, they just need to get a pedant like me, someone who understands speech, to go through it. I'd do it for a, we could do it together, for money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. I love it. Sebastian, you're just giving out jobs. You told Lionel to move to your publisher, and now you found me a job as well. <laughs> But it, I mean, I mean, I would say as a writer of historical fiction, obviously, I think it matters completely, because there's this whole festival this weekend is extraordinary for the range of topics that are being discussed and the people who are here to speak. It's an amazing festival of thought. This one, um, compared to many book festivals, um, but history is about how the past and the present speak to each other, and also how history is used to justify decisions being made now that influence people's lives now. So if you are dishonest, often or inaccurate about the past in your fiction, then there can be huge consequences for that. When people go, well, look, you know, this has never happened. So I think that's quite important as well. Uh, gentleman over there. Forgive the nebulous question, but we've had a fascinating debate about the role of authenticity in some sense. So can you write about Botswana if you've never been to Botswana? Uh, but if we were sitting here at a a gathering of news editors, we'd be having a conversation about how the world's moving to a world with social media where it's okay just to make everything up and we have fake news and there's no you know, concept of authenticity is becoming less valued. So the question is really, is, is there a reason why the, the publishing world's going that way and social media and a lot of the rest of the world seems to be going the other, the other way? Is there any connection? Is there a reaction between one and the other? Mm. And why that the publishers go that way and social media's gone that way rather than the other way around. What's going on here about authenticity and who owns it and which ideas are allowed to be authentic and which uh, are allowed not to be authentic? It's a terrific question. I'm not sure in three minutes we're going to cope with that, but I don't know. Chibinder, do you want to take that um, or anybody else if you don't have a particular... I didn't know that I have an answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Excellent. <laughs> Mr. Folks. <laughs> um, well, I think it goes back to what Lionel said at the beginning. Who's making these rules? And to some extent, you just feel it empirically. You feel a balance swaying. And you feel when, when someone like Tabundig is a very good example of, you know, the, the latest detective agency and there's a, better, there's a better version, a book that should be better known, that is a concrete example which shifts you in your mind and you think, yes, that's a really good, concrete, easy to understand example. And you know, if I were a publisher, it would make me think. Uh, and would I now commission such and such a book, or would I try very hard to commission such and such a different book? But I mean, for a writer, you know, like, we're just like anyone. We are all we're just people, like all of us here. We we read a lot and we think and we try and sift and sieve and think which bits make sense, which bits work. Where is there a consensus? that I now need to change my mind. You know, Frank Fields has just changed his mind about assisted dying, mm. having been a sort of lifelong vehement a religious opponent of it. You know, you do change your mind, and you can change your mind, but it would be terribly <laughs> helpful for us if we knew who was making these rules and whether it's just an anonymous 14-year-old under an assumed name <laughs> or whether it's sensible, grown-up, wise, good-humoured people who are striving for a better world. And, yeah. um, ultimately, I, I don't think it matters who makes up the rules. If they're dumb rules, they're dumb rules, and you don't obey them. <laughs> well, I even mean, if they're coming yeah. from ostensibly wise people, <coughs> wise people still come up with dumb ideas. Well, also in the world of publishing, there is finance. I mean, you know, if, if stuff is dumb and books are dumb and they're written to a program that doesn't appeal to people, the publishers will go bankrupt. But the problem is in, in areas of life where there is no financial operation, there's no financial motive. So don't let's get started on universities. <laughs> <laughs> That's next year's panel. Um, yeah. Final question there. No woman has asked a question. I know all men have asked questions. I mean, well done, men. But ladies, you've let us down. Um, all right, I'll take the question. Oh, hello. Hello, Francis. Take a question from you. Sorry, sir. 
Thank you. Hi, hi there. Just going back to the first topic in this discussion, to what extent do you feel that each of you is now required to do anything more than treat cultures or people that are not yourself with respect? Is, you know, to what extent is it more than just treating people with respect? Not and much. Doing it well. Not much. Uh, there are plenty of characters I've created which are not worthy of respect. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> That's not necessarily the purpose of a character is to be respected. And I think what, what is one of the big mistakes uh, that proponents of the cultural pro appropriation taboo make is has to do with to whom an author's characters belongs. My characters belong to me, okay? So I, I can make a character uh, who is, say, Taiwanese. And that's a, it's a character that I intend to be completely ludicrous, okay? Now, maybe I wouldn't, in this current environment, choose to do that, but let's say that I did, I needed to in this particular story. I'm not going to make that character, uh, I'm not going to make you respect that character. The character is going to be ludicrous because that's what the story calls for. It's my character. It doesn't belong to the, Chi the, the Taiwanese, right? That's the mistake. Just because I create a character that belongs to a different group than I belong to doesn't mean that character belongs to that group. It doesn't. Nor does it mean that that character is some kind of a diplomatic representative of all the Taiwanese people in the world. No. It's one little character in one little book. So it's this compulsion to generalize that is coming out of the identity politics movement that is making us mis make these ridiculous mistakes about what it means to write a fictional character. Final word from you, Chibunda. Well, one of the first things I learned when my novels came out is that you don't have a monopoly on how people interpret your work. And once you put characters that you created in your imagination out into the public, then it is open to interpretation. And so if you write a Taiwanese character that you thought is, you know, it, it demands that she be a ludicrous character, um, you put it out into the world, and if Taiwanese people interpret, interpret that in a specific way, that's the game. That's how fiction works. And so it's, you can write whatever you like, and I, I stand by that. I stand with everybody on this panel. Write whatever you like, but when you do so, be prepared that there's going to be feedback. It's going to go out into the world, and people are going to interpret it. And yes, that's the world we live in. Well, that is it. I think that is a brilliant place to end. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank Sandra Scriber, Sebastian, Bolton and Lindsay. They will be signing in the bookshop over there. Um, thank you all very much. Amazing. Right. <laughs>